Hello, welcome to another episode of Taboo Tuesday. Today I'm here with James Quigg. We are talking about the awesome topic of emotions and emotional impact on rational decision making. That is a mouthful. Um, I met James through Sam, and I own, I never can pronounce your last name. What is Haber. it? Paul uh, Haber. Paul Haber, thank you. Samantha Paul Haber introduced us through a really cool challenge called Listen Up. Um, I'd love to chat about that, but we only got 15 minutes here. So look into that if you're interested. Um, and then James, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself a little bit more. Hi, I'm James Quigg. Uh, background wise, I currently am a uh, head instructor for a martial arts school in Marietta, Georgia. Before that, I was a public school teacher in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, through that and before that, I was a professional MMA fighter and I also was an officer in the US Army from 2010 to 2015 with some little reserve time after that. Um, so that was five years active duty. Four of those I was with the 82nd and yeah, that's kind of, that's, it in a nutshell. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's like so many different nuggets of perspective. And that's one of the reasons I love talking about people with this stuff, because we all have such fascinating perspectives that can help us learn how to live maybe a little bit better. Um, so again, I love this topic you suggested, emotions and emotional impact on rational decision makings. We all have felt emotions. Um, yesterday, my friend Ted was telling me about an analogy for emotions where if you think of every human as a waterbender, um, emotions are like waves. They can be super tiny, they can be super big, and they can be harder to control and they can be easier to control. And yada 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 so the first thing um that you want to chat about is a story about um feelings overruling rational thoughts well so one thing i have to say before i say anything else is that any analogy that connects back to avatar the last airbender i am here for for life for <laughs> always and ever yes um so this is a thing that I really started paying attention to when I first got the job as a public school teacher. And the thing that no one really talks about with public school or teaching groups of kids of pretty much any age group is how little of that job set is the actual providing of information. Like, yes, having good lesson plans, having fun activities planned, being engaging, being sociable is important. But like 90% of being a good teacher is your ability to create a relationship with your students. And one of the biggest skills that in, for you to create that relationship with your students is to be able to manage the classroom because if you can't manage the classroom, you can't teach anything and you can't really build a relationship. And so I was super fortunate that the school, the middle school I worked for had the time, had the budget to send me as a lateral entry teacher, meaning that my undergraduate degree was not in education. I was not a certified teacher, but the state of North Carolina was hurting for teachers so much that anybody with a, um, that they would hire folks with a bachelor's degree as long as they had sufficient credits in the content area to teach and then help them or you know tell them hey so we're going to give you this license for three years and then you've got to take college courses on your own time to finish out the certification grueling but they were able to send me to a classroom management um workshop that lasted about three days before i got hired changed my attitude towards interacting with people writ large the biggest quote that got dropped that just totally shifted the way that I looked is that the presenter said, hey, the brain is not a thinking machine that has feelings. The brain is a feeling machine that can think sometimes if it's not in its feelings. Mm. And it's realizing if we look at the brain from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, our emotions and our procedural memory 
they happened first and then we slowly started developing the forebrain and the cerebellum over years as that became more and more useful and that's where a lot of our conscious memory and our rational decision making can happen and because that other stuff and those irrational those emotions happen further back they're going to tend to overrule and influence that conscious thought whether we acknowledge it or not and the number one most effective way to help a child who's having an emotional incident in your classroom is not to respond with your own emotions is not to punish and threaten and scare them into compliance it's to put them in a space where they can feel that emotion, process it, and then let them come back and learn. So the school I was at um, implemented this really effective policy of having reset rooms. So teacher, a kid starts acting up, it's disrupting other students learning, the teacher gets frustrated, teacher, doesn't, teacher is supposed to send that student to a reset room for five to 15 minutes and the student comes back. And when what was super interesting to look at was the number of parents who read an article written about this policy and the way that it was significantly increasing performance, reducing the number of punishments and referrals, and generally making life better for students at this school. You had a ton of parents being like, that's so dumb. These kids just need to get harder punishment. Someone needs to hit these kids. And I'm like, when? has introducing physical violence ever actually helped a kid calm down? Yeah. Like I've seen it make kids compliant, but that kid's not learning anymore. Yeah, yeah, that like everything you just said there, I'm just like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> really, really good stuff. That makes me, like my brain is going to so many options. I'm thinking about mindfulness, I'm thinking about um, two, uh, years ago, I read a book called Self Compassion, and it talks about actual scientific studies that show that, like, you know, when somebody else is hard on us, when somebody else uh, gives us a slap, when we make a mistake, we're not actually learning. We're just, it's just uncomfortable. And we do the same things to ourselves, right? Like, sometimes when we fail, we'll be like, oh gosh, I'm so stupid. But that's not helpful to ourselves. If we're able to be kind to ourselves, if other people are able to be kind to us and be like, okay, that didn't go according to plan, let's reset. I think your students need this just as much as I do, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> right. Um, so it's super interesting you say about that. One other thing that they talked about in that is we used to, when I was a kid, they talked about how nerve cells were the only cells in your brain where you can't grow new ones. Once you have nerve damage, that's done. And we're finding out that that's very much not true. Hmm. And even if it is true in terms of the number of nerve cells that you have, your nerves are constantly growing and changing shapes. Mm -hmm. And so it was super, it really changed my perspective when I learned the fact that every single thought you have makes a physical change in your brain. Because every time you have a thought, it runs an electrical current that links a number of, an unknown number of nerves together. And every time that electrical signal is sent, it brings, it strengthens the connection between those two nerves or those 10 <laughs> nerves or those millions. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So literally every thought that you have physically changes your brain, mm -hmm. making it easier to think that same thought again. Mm -hmm. So every yeah. time you think I made a mistake, this is a great opportunity to learn you make yourself better at learning from mistakes and make yourself less likely to make mistakes going forward. And those are, that's like such a beneficial human skill set. Like ideally everybody has that skill set, but of course, you know, that's an idealistic world. And, and again, right now we're kind of shifting and talking about something else I'm super passionate about, which is learning. But at the end of the day, learning is very much a quote unquote rational process. Mm -hmm. unless depending or right? mm -hmm. what we're finding out more and more is that it's not rational and things that are needed are relevancy and repetition and if you repeat information that is relevant to your life you're going to learn that mm -hmm. understanding that kids are always learning no matter what they just may not be learning what you actually want them to learn 
Like, exactly, exactly. And I'm going to take this moment to pause. We are, I'm loving this conversation, but I just want to keep us on track again. Um, you also wanted to talk about um, Danielle Kahneman's uh, two different systems, which I find fascinating. So for those who haven't read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, essentially what it is, is he breaks down his overarching theory of human thought, which is that you have system one, very, very fast, very, very intuitive, um, and really pulls on your subconscious biases and your emotional state. And system two is your conscious, rational, slow decision making. It's slow, it's more calorie intensive. So your body, as much as possible, and your brain, as much as possible, tries to engage system one to solve problems. And this disconnect between the two systems and two processes of thought between your slow deliberate rational decision making and your quick repetitive intuitive decision making results in a number of thought fallacies yeah. uh, things like when you look around and you see hey everybody who has done this has encountered these same challenges i don't think that my particular group is going to face these challenges because of reason x y and z and then you get super frustrated when you encounter the very challenges that you thought you could hand wave away. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't want to solve that problem. And um, here I am having to solve that problem. Why, how could this have happened? Another thing is things like the availability heuristic. And it's just a laundry list of pure thought errors that every human being is guilty of. And Kahneman essentially breaks down me, Nobel Prize winning scientist, social scientist, here are times in my life where I knew about these mistakes and I made them anyway. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it kind of pointed out to me how much of our thought processes are informed by subconscious states and subconscious um, worldview situations that we can't control or that we can't control until we take the time to be consciously aware of them. And even once we're consciously aware of them, we still make, may make mistakes. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it takes making a lot of mistakes before you finally are able to act differently, even when you know better. And we've all had times like this, you know, like I've had months at a time where I set my alarm for five in the morning and I just click snooze and I go right back to bed and it happens over and over. But then maybe eventually something will shift all you know, and maybe I'll eventually be able to do it one day. Um, or maybe it just doesn't work for your body. Right, right. Maybe I need to listen to my body and, and realize that, like, maybe my body is going to be happier when I wake up at 7 a.m. Um, extremes don't work for everybody. Um, we only have a few minutes left. These almost fly by. This has been so fascinating. Um, I know you wanted to tell one more story about a friend um, and emotions. Well, so in this particular case, it was a super interesting situation where a friend was working and volunteering. She homeschooled and she was one of the ways that she was working on getting her kids more socialization and more quality socialization was through a Boy Scouts organization. Mm -hmm. She started volunteering with the organization, working her way up with the regional, at the regional level and her particular um, like scout pack or whatever they're called was getting ready to go on a group trip. And then this, this woman who was a mother who had children who were in the Boy Scouts wanted to bring along these two other kids that she babysat. Now these kids that she babysat weren't members of the Boy Scout troop. They weren't members of Boy Scouts of America at all. Uh, this woman wasn't their guardian. This woman, you know, she said, oh no, the kids' parents don't want to come. The kids' parents don't want them to join Boy Scouts. And they do want them to come on this thing anyway. And my friend was like, well, hey, if they don't want to join Boy Scouts, if they don't want to come, and they don't want to sign off on any of the documentation associated with, no. They can't come. And she got a little bit of context is that the, the mother who was trying to bring this person along used to be the Cub Scout leader 
and got removed from being the Cub Scout leader for misconduct in the past. And it was said, hey, we're not totally kicking your kids out of this organization. We are going to make it, we are going to say that you can be a parent and you can be involved as a parent, but you cannot be in any sort of leadership role within this organization. And the parent who took over after her was trying to tell my friend that my friend wasn't being rational and that, you know, this was just coming from an emotional place of not liking this individual mother. And my friend was over here saying, hey, no, look, I am not a big fan of this woman. I also am 100% in favor of our Boy Scout troop going and more kids having access to these kinds of opportunities. We have a we have procedures and plans and policies in place for these kids to be able to come along and they're all contingent on the kids joining the Boy Scouts of America organization. And what was really happening is that the, the leader of the troop wasn't comfortable with telling the other mom no. And his fear was leading him to make an irrational decision and taking on the incredible risks of letting these kids on. And he 100% believed that he was being the rational, reasonable person in this situation. And I think that's the biggest thing that I want to get to, that I really want to get across, is that your emotions are constantly in influencing your decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you can make, and, and you have to be aware of that. You have to acknowledge that. And if you're being aware of your emotions, you're going to make better decisions. Exactly. Period. And that, that's like, that's just like a beautiful way to end it. We have just a few minutes or really just a minute left here. Um, I want to say so many things, but I'm going to, I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to leave it be because that was beautiful. Um, it makes me think of mindfulness and so many other lovely topics. Uh, I hope to have you on the show another time. Again, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I hope you guys on the other side of the screen enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, again, I love talking about any topics taboo. If you want to um, DM me, have a conversation, be on the show, reach out, let me know. Um, and I will see you next week for some more Taboo Tuesday. Bye. Bye.